This video is sponsored by World Anvil. Happy Halloween, boy! Welcome to this year's spooky video. Today we're talking about a very spooky subject... Hang on. Huh. It's November. Okay, well, anyway, uh, today we're talking about a spooky campaign setting for Thanksgiving. Uh, we're going to talk about Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft today. Now, some of you might remember that I made a video about this book a few months ago, but I specifically tackled the parts of the book that give you guidance on creating villains, because it was part of my villain series of videos. Well, now we're returning to the book for an installment in my series about campaign settings, and we're going to determine whether or not the world of Ravenloft, as presented in this book, Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, is a solid campaign setting worth your time, and what kind of gameplay the setting fosters from your players and from you as the game master. Also, I'm going to make some references to the other book set in the same campaign setting, Curse of Strahd. It really only talks about one corner of the setting, but there are a few times where something or someone is better fleshed out in that book rather than in Van Richten's Guide. Uh, that being said, in comparison to someplace like The Forgotten Realms, uh, the fact that this setting is only spread out across two books, and really only barely spread out across two books, is pretty manageable, and it helps that both those books are pretty good. The first question in my campaign setting rubric is simple. Does Ravenloft have a clear premise? Well, let's see how easily we can describe it. Ravenloft is actually more of a catch-all name to describe a collection of locations called Domains of Dread. Each domain is inspired by horror stories of some type. Gothic horror, body horror, cosmic horror, etc. And each domain has a Dark Lord, a ruler who is also a prisoner. This Dark Lord is someone completely wicked who was brought to this domain by unfathomable dark powers as a form of punishment. The Dark Lord cannot leave the Domain of Dread but they're also in control of just about everything else that happens in their domain. As we've talked about before, many Dark Lords are truly terrific villains because they're, by definition, irredeemable and unable to see the error of their ways. And if these villains ever die, it's honestly just a matter of time before they return and the land resets to the same status quo, which means you can keep returning to any domain over and over with the same players, and there's a canonical reason why the world would be the same as it was the last time they were there, or why it might be different in some other interesting ways that you can decide because of the, the inherent evil of the land. Now, each domain is basically like a region of a D&D world. Maybe it's the size of an entire country, or the size of a valley, or only the size of a dungeon. But, well, but they're all different, and while they're theoretically connected, they're hard to cross between. Supernatural mists fill the spaces between these domains, and these mists make it extremely difficult to pass through them and traverse the domains. Though the book provides some exceptions and some methods to do so. These domains are all located in the Shadowfell, and some of them are literally regions pulled from the material plane and turned into domains, while others, like Cardacos and Lamordia, are created by the Dark Powers to become perfect reflections to torment their Dark Lords. So essentially these are horror worlds you can introduce into your game whenever, and the heroes can't escape until you want them to, and nearly every domain has one horrible ruler that the heroes need to conquer. And all the other details are just there to help make sure your players can't wander off the map before you're ready. So yeah, I would actually say that Ravenloft has a pretty clear premise. That being said, and this is not a knock against the setting, it's just a little weird, the reason this collection of domains is known as Ravenloft is just because the first domain of dread that was established in the D&D canon was in the adventure Ravenloft, which is sometimes called Castle Ravenloft to avoid confusion. But naming this entire campaign setting after Castle Ravenloft doesn't make any sense, because Castle Ravenloft is the seat of power in Barovia, which is just one domain. That would be like if we named countries after one administrative location in one state. It's like if the United States was named Sacramento City Hall. The Domains of Dread it would be a more accurate name, but thanks to that very first module, Ravenloft is considered the brand, so fair enough, I guess. Also, a bunch of people in each domain don't have souls. They were created to fully populate each world, but some of them are basically just empty shells, and I don't feel like that detail adds much. It kind of feels like an excuse for players to not care about unimportant NPCs, which is the opposite of what I enjoy about D&D. If you do like the idea that some of the citizens don't have souls, or if you've at least found an interesting way to incorporate that detail into your games, then sound off in the comments below because I would love to know what appeals to you about it. There's also one aspect where I feel like the book cuts corners in such a strange way, and again, this is the tiniest detail, it's not even worth mentioning, but I'm still gonna. First, we learn that all domains share a language, which is fine, that's honestly fine with me. But then we learn that all domains, except Barovia, the place the Curse of Strahd takes place, all the other domains share a year. They all take place in the same year, on the same calendar. What? Why? This is so weird. And honestly, I'd recommend that you check out Mythic Odysseys of Theros and use that setting's calendar system instead. In Theros, there's no clear sense of time. 
anything that happened in the prior years almost immediately becomes ancient history and or myth. And I honestly think that approach works way better for the Domains of Dread, especially since domains are constantly resetting in an endless loop of suffering. Again, that's such a little thing, I, I kind of feel silly even mentioning it. And this is the only reason I feel silly right now. So we've determined Ravenloft has a clear premise, but does it have a distinct tone? That's the next question, and again, I think the answer is yes, although I'll qualify that one a little bit. Each domain has its own tone and genre of horror, and while you think that would delude the overall tone to something more vague, like just horror, the book actually gives you a fair bit of instruction on how to run each genre of horror, and then each domain is assigned one of these genres, so you have the resources to run a game with, yes, a very clear tone. Now, while each domain is very clearly different, we do still have a very clear influence of Eastern European tropes and names across many of those domains to help connect Ravenloft to its gothic horror roots. And then there are actually some factions and NPCs who can appear in any domain. They're in Chapter 3. They're referred to as the Mist Wanderers. That's not like a a team name or anything like that, that's just the term the book gives them. But most of those characters have some extremely strong gothic horror vibes, but we'll talk about those characters in a little bit. The next question is, does Ravenloft have any iconic imagery? And yeah, it definitely does. We have a few examples here. First, we've got the mists. I know it kind of feels like just saying fog is a cop-out, but I think there are two reasons why the mists feel like an extremely important part of Ravenloft. First, Fog and mist are kind of an iconic horror bit of iconography. We can see it in film all the time, from movies where it adds atmosphere, like uh, the, the Exorcist or City of the Dead, to stories where it plays a plot role, like the obvious examples, The Fog and The Mist. I haven't seen any of those movies, by the way, because I'm a big scaredy cat, but I know it's a thing. But the second reason the mists of Ravenloft are iconic is because, more often than not, they're literally how your player characters wind up in a domain of dread. Characters wander into the fog, and then they wind up in a totally new land. And the mists surround the borders of these domains, keeping anyone from being able to leave. And if somebody does try to leave, the mists drain you and exhaust you and potentially kill you. And even if you do manage to pass through the mist, that does not mean that you'll be able to determine where you're going and what domain you'll wind up in. After all, it is famously pretty difficult to navigate in mist. So the mists really are an iconic bit of imagery that actually makes the Domains of Dread possible. In fact, on page six, it's clear that the mists could steal you away for just an entire campaign or only a single one shot. The mists are there to help you run whatever Ravenloft game you have in mind. The next iconic image is Strahd. I mean, obviously. Ravenloft started with the cover image of Strahd standing on the balcony of his castle. And in a lot of ways, that is still the image that many of the domains revolve around. I'm not just referring to the way some of the Dark Lords have history and lore tied up with Strahd, although that is a thing. More than one Dark Lord has either met Strahd or spent some time in Barovia. But the Eastern European-inspired iconography we see in so many domains, uh, the gothic horror influences that are present in a lot of the meta lore, and even the fact that nearly every domain has somebody like Strahd at the wheel, that all reflects how iconic Strahd is as a character. And so he's basically the de facto face of Ravenloft. Hell, the whole domain is named after his house. Now, I just mentioned the Eastern European and Gothic horror tropes that cross between a lot of the domains, and so now I gotta talk about another iconic and unfortunate bit of the setting, and that's the Vistani. For those unfamiliar, the Vistani are heavily inspired by pop culture depictions of the Romani. They're nomadic, they travel around in wagons and play instruments and dance, the women are fortune tellers, they can curse people with an evil eye, they're literally magic, some of them are assassins and or people who will sell out the heroes to the bad guys. It's all very uncomfortable. Narratively, the Vistani are useful. They can cross between the domains easily. From what I can tell, this idea originates from the fact that Strahd allows the Vistani to live freely in his realm. They can come and go as they please. So that idea has been extended to the point that the Vistani can wander in and out of any domain because, you know, because Strahd's adventure set the template for uh, all of Ravenloft. I talked about that earlier. I don't tend to use the Vistani in my Strahd games anymore, not only because I don't think you need a culture of people who can travel freely between domains, I feel like if anybody has that power it should really be limited to just a couple of NPCs and not an entire people, but if that sort of culture is going to exist, I especially don't feel that they should be heavily inspired by racist myths about the Romani. I know they've tried to clean up the Vistani in publications recently, but I usually just drop them from my games entirely. I can still include one random fortune teller or monster hunter without making those characters members of an entire group of stereotypes. Now, on the subject of the Vistani and the fortune tellers, they're connected to another iconic image from Ravenloft, the Taroka deck. This deck is inspired by Tarot, except the titles and artwork are all in the vein, 
pun intended, of gothic horror. But the best part is that there are opportunities in Ravenloft Adventures for Taroka readings to determine certain aspects of the campaign. The most famous example comes from the Ravenloft module, and later, Curse of Strahd, where a Taroka reading can guide you to find the magic items you need to kill Strahd. And you could probably do the same thing with campaigns set in other domains. There's no guidance for it, but it would be pretty easy to figure out. Additionally, you could just use the deck to read fortunes for your player characters. The info for how to do that is in Curse of Strahd, uh, but the Van Richten's book does include a spirit board. I'm not sure I would say that's quite as iconic, but it is pretty useful for any ghost-based stories you might be telling. A lot of the Dark Lords are also clear references to, or knockoffs, of famous horror characters and or public domain monsters. Strahd is Dracula, obviously. The Carnival is modeled after stories like Something Wicked This Way Comes. Duchess Sidra is a direct reference to Cinderella. Anktapot is a reference to all the classic mummy stories, because they all pretty much hit the same beats. Victra Mordenheim is literally just Frankenstein, the scientist, not the monster although there is a monster running around in her domain. One of the shorter entries, Odair, is like an evil version of the Pinocchio story. And another, Gastria, is inspired by the portrait of Dorian Gray. And Valakon is basically just the most dangerous game as a domain of dread. So these characters and locations all feel iconic because they call to mind some famous stories that most of us are already pretty familiar with through pop cultural osmosis. And the cool thing is, you can do the same thing in your own games. You can take iconic, beloved characters and give them the old Dark Lord twist. Ahem. <laughs> I believe we have some experience in that regard. Wow! It's public domain characters Winnie the Pooh and Dracula! That's right. We are both horror icons who have been interpreted in countless ways for new audiences. I just want to be clear that I'm not a horror icon. Well, I'm just glad you're both here. Uh, I was actually just about to read the World Anvil ad. Do you want to help me with that? Of course. World Anvil is a fantastic online toolkit that you can use for your own games. Their tantalizing templates allow you to charm your players and impress them with your vast lore. Like, I'm a kid's character. The only reason they make horror movies about me is because they can. That doesn't say anything about me. World Anvil also supports multiple game systems, so you can play your game through the website, including horror games like Call of Cthulhu, or brutal action games like Conan. You can make a horror movie about anything, but making it about me just shows that they're dark and edgy. But people were doing this kind of thing on YouTube a decade ago. It's not edgy. If you are an aspiring novelist, or simply a busybody sending letters home from the castle of a vampire, you can also write your manuscript in World Anvil, so you can write while easily accessing your setting, the perfect way to create the next great horror icon. I used to mean something. And if you visit worldanvil.com slash supergeekmike and use the promo code supergeek, you can save 40% off of any annual membership. Once again, that's worldanvil.com slash supergeekmike, and use the promo code supergeek. Thank you so much to World Anvil for sponsoring the video. That was great. Thanks, guys. Do you want to hang out for the rest of the video? Alas, we cannot. We have a meeting with a Hollywood producer to discuss a grisly slasher film, where we both butcher countless co-eds and bathe in their blood. Ugh, it's going to make just so much money. Well, thanks so much to both of you for stopping by. Nice guys. Although I'm not sure I should have invited that guy into my house. Winnie the Pooh is a murderer after all. I'm not... Ah, oh, forget it. Now something else I look for in a campaign setting review is whether the setting provides character creation inspiration. And here my answer is... Sort of? Yes and no? Well yes, but it's complicated. There are some very cool horror-themed character options in the book, like the Dampier, which is like a half-vampire character ancestry, so you can play somebody like Blade. There's the Hexblood, which is like a tiefling but for hags instead of devils or demons. The Reborn, which is just like it sounds, it's an ancestry for someone who has come back to life after having died. There are dark gifts you can give to your players either during the campaign, or they can take one of these dark gifts during character creation to make their characters extra spooky. There's a College of Spirits subclass for the Bard, an undead patron for Warlocks, and some spooky backgrounds like the Haunted One or the Investigator. And all these features are designed to help players create characters who match the gothic horror themes, which makes sense. But also, in my opinion, this runs the risk of making these characters feel less like outsiders who got pulled into the domain of dread, which reduces what I find to be the most fun part of the Ravenloft format. Now, I definitely understand why players would want to play characters who fit some sort of spooky vibe, and in some cases, that can still work with the kinds of Ravenloft stories that I enjoy. For example, in one of my Curse of Strahd games, one of the player characters is a spooky little boy with an imaginary friend who gives him warlock powers. The character was created before Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft was released, but still feels like he fits the vibe of a spooky game really well. 
But in my game, he mainly works because he was the exception when the game began. He was the one person who immediately thrived in the spooky world, while the rest of the players got to react to how spooky he was, and that made everybody happy. He got to play somebody spooky who creeped out the other people, and the other players got to be the fish-out-of-water characters freaked out by what's going on. I generally like to run games where the players don't feel like they're part of the horror, because that Isekai format helps enhance the impact of the horror in my experience. As another example of the discrepancy I'm talking about, on page 14 there's a passage that reads, Inhabitants rarely mistake heroes for monsters. But if a player character chooses to play using the spooky character options, then I would argue that some of them kind of want to be mistaken for a monster. That's actually the fantasy for them. And for those reasons, it kind of seems like the player options are in the wrong book. That being said, first of all, you don't have to play in Ravenloft to use these character options. Anybody can buy the book and use them if the GM says it's okay. So you can be a spooky character in any campaign. But second, and much more importantly, the fish-out-of-water approach we're discussing that I like to run is just one type of game you can run in the domains of dread. If you're going to instead play characters who hail from one specific domain, or who are willingly crossing between domains, then these spooky player character options probably serve your needs much better. And in fact, we do also get sidebars uh, in each of the published domains, which offer prompts and guidance on how a player character could be from that domain. And that is helpful as long as the uh, GM is offering that information to their players, if that's the campaign they want to run. So overall, the player character options are kind of a mixed bag for me, and I would really recommend you let your players know what tone you're going for in your game, and find out what format of horror game they would most be excited about before deciding whether or not to let the players use these options. If they want to feel like spooky characters, then your campaign should be formatted to accommodate them. If they're okay feeling like relatively normal people, or just average adventurers who get pulled into a world of nightmares, then I don't think these character options serve that fantasy very well. Speaking of campaign formats, does Ravenloft offer any plot hooks? Yes, absolutely, 100%. Each domain and each Dark Lord comes with a bunch of plot hooks, including old enemies and allies, significant locations and factions, and maybe some magic item or prophecy or something to guide the heroes. There are also some domains that are mobile and can enter other domains for a one-shot or a side quest. These include the Carnival, uh, Seer 1313, the haunted train from Eberron, the Nightmare Lands, Skena and Rebilios, which are just playhouses that you could drop into any city in any other domain. The Vage Agency, which is kind of a noir-themed detective agency that can cross into any domain. The Rider's Bridge, with a headless rider who guards a bridge, and that bridge could also be used to bring characters from one domain to another, if you want. And the Sea of Sorrows, which could actually connect any domain with a body of water, and also has one of my favorite Dark Lord designs. If we step back from the individual domains, the Realm of Ravenloft also has some characters who can appear in any domain. Besides factions like the Keepers of the Feather and the Vistani, we also get a bunch of cool monster hunters who can travel between domains and become allies in your games. Ez Davanir and Rudolf Van Richten are in the Curse of Strahd module, and they return here, along with the ghost of Rudolf's son Erasmus. But we also get other characters like Alonic Ray and Arthur Sedgwick, which are basically Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, except the brilliant detective is in a wheelchair. Their investigations usually result in having to hunt monsters, and they're canonically married. They're great. I love them. We get Ferran Zalhonen, who is a very complicated figure who might help people or screw them over. I like him a lot. There's Jander Sunstar, who's a very interesting anti-hero, and I won't say more than that here. There's Larissa Snowmane, who pilots a paddle boat around Ravenloft, which is a very funny visual. Like, I don't know, maybe they mean a steamboat. These are sometimes called paddle steamers. And honestly, there are lots of different kinds of paddle boats, but that's why I just, I would love some art of the boat, because without it, I'm just picturing this. And finally, we get the Weathermay Foxgrove twins, a pair of twin sisters who have a history with hunting werewolves. I like them a lot, too. We also have some sinister forces that can cross between, like some other factions, and monsters like the Caller, who's basically an ultimate figure of temptation. It's a really fascinating and ominous creature, and a GM could use it as the hook for a ton of interesting stories. Well, that was a lot of information about all those characters, which actually perfectly segues into my next question. Does Ravenloft have daunting lore? And the answer is... no. You're good. There's absolutely information out there. People who are running Curse of Strahd or other Ravenloft games have recommended the licensed novels published in the Ravenloft setting, especially I, Strahd, but I haven't read those books, and I would be curious to check them out at some point, but honestly, everything you need to run a Ravenloft adventure is in Ben Rickton's Guide to Ravenloft or Curse of Strahd. And honestly, regarding the lore in Curse of Strahd, Sure, it fills in some gaps from the uh, Van Richten's Guide, but not so much that I think you'd miss out if you didn't also buy Curse of Strahd. Additionally, there's a very dedicated online community surrounding Ravenloft, and especially around Curse of Strahd. So there are literally hundreds of pages that you can reference for insights on specific aspects of lore you want to dive deeper into. But not only is it not necessary to read any of that in order to run a great Ravenloft game, but even if you do decide to dig into a certain subject, 
The domains of Dread are specifically very modular, so it's super easy to dig into just one domain, or one villain, or one helpful NPC, and not find yourself stuck having to sort through a daunting amount of information. And the final question on our rubric, are there blank spaces on the map? This can be literal, like, are there spaces where you invited to create your own content, but also in terms of lore, where there might be questions left open for you to answer however you see fit. In both cases, the answer is absolutely yes. First, in an extremely literal way, Ravenloft is an endless source of blank spaces to fill in. Not only is each domain's map pretty basic with plenty of room to add your own stuff, but also there's no limit to the number of domains or Dark Lords you can introduce. This book gives you a whole bunch of guidance on how to create an effective Dark Lord and a suitable campaign for them. So the writers are absolutely encouraging you to fill in those gaps on the map, but not because they were too lazy to come up with something, just because... Building domains and Dark Lords is a ton of fun, and you should feel empowered to create the best villains for your party. Along the same lines, there's plenty of lore that is left ambiguous, so you as the Game Master can decide on the answers. For example, the Dark Powers are complete mysteries. Who are they? How do they choose who becomes a Dark Lord? What do they want, and why? I have my own answers to those questions, but you can decide on the best answers for your own games. Additionally, some of the domains have mysteries that are left for you to answer. For example, in the domain of Darkon, the Lich Azalen is gone. Who knows to where? His domain is in ruins, but there's a beacon of light in the center of the sky that might hold the answers to fixing his domain. But what is it? What's inside, if anything? You can decide that based on what you think is cool and what will best suit the story that you're telling and the characters you're running for. The book also frequently reminds the reader that the Dark Lord might not be the most physically daunting or dangerous enemy in the domain, which means that there is a lot of room for you to create any sort of adversary who might be more obviously powerful than the Dark Lord. As an example, perhaps you have a domain modeled after Gotham City, where the Dark Lord is somebody like the Joker, who is not really known for being a gifted fighter. You could absolutely still have another villain in the same domain who is a big bruiser like Bane to provide a more dangerous physical threat to the heroes than the Dark Lord does. Now, I personally prefer when the Dark Lord is the highest CR enemy in the region, but that does not mean that they have to be the most physically Im imposing, especially if they're a spellcaster. And besides, that's just my style. And the fact that they're offering more room for different types of stories just proves my point that this book does offer lots of room to create your own fun. I really like the creative potential in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. I've talked before about how I like campaign settings in the vein of 4th edition's Points of Light setting, and I will make another video about that someday. But the idea behind that style is that civilization only exists as points of light in a wilderness of danger. Here, we don't even get that level of safety. We get islands of danger in a sea of uncharted mystery. Because of that, Ravenloft suits itself well for the types of stories that I like to run. I like that there aren't any magic shops or high-level allies in positions of authority who can pull your fat out of the fire. And I like the experience of running these sorts of horror games. Full disclosure, I don't enjoy watching horror movies, and I don't really like Halloween that much because I don't like being scared or being grossed out. But when I know what's coming, I'm fine. I can watch any horror movie a second time and just appreciate it as a movie. I was so excited to watch the It movies because the casts were incredible, so all day before I saw each movie, I poured over social media so I could watch bootleg clips of the scary scenes so I would know it was coming when those moments arrived. And in a weird way, that's kind of why I like running games like Curse of Strahd. Once I know what's coming, I'm fine. And if I'm running the game, then I generally have a pretty good idea of which spooks and scares might be coming up next. But it's also important that you don't take things too far. And this book is actually really good about giving you the proper tools to handle horror responsibly. Yes, each genre of horror has recommendations for how to handle them responsibly, and even just giving you the different genres helps give you the tools to discuss the types of horror with your players. But honestly, the book is sending the message of responsible horror from the very beginning. On page 5, it reminds you that your goal should be the same as the creators of a roller coaster. You want your players to experience fear, but to also feel reassured that they are actually completely safe in your hands. And the fact that the book is written with that in mind has a huge influence on the way the information is presented across the whole book, in a way that is extremely useful, but also empathetic and aware of the impact it might have on your players. I haven't had a chance to run a Ravenloft game that isn't Curse of Strahd yet, but whenever I flip through this book, I get so many ideas. I would love to run a Darkon campaign, which takes place in a world that's coming apart at the seams. I haven't played Dark Souls 2, but from what I can see, you could easily use that game as an inspiration for a Darkon campaign. Falkovnia is a zombie apocalypse setting, and like a lot of modern zombie fiction, it's really more about the callousness of the people in power, and I think that would be a terrific short campaign. Harakir, the domain of the mummy lord Anktapot, could be a huge sandbox campaign, pun absolutely intended. And honestly, on revisiting this book for this video, I'm starting to think about what it would look like to run a campaign where the characters actually do wander between domains. I know B. Dave Walters ran a campaign called the Black Dice Society, where that was the premise. I've always meant to check out that podcast, but 
I would especially be curious to watch for some inspiration on a Ravenloft campaign. And I once played in a brief Curse of Strahd sequel campaign that visited some domains. This was before Van Richten's Guide was released, but it would not be hard to recreate that format. But I'll also ask you, have you ever run a campaign where the characters wandered the mists of Ravenloft? What tips or suggestions do you have? Let us know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please click the like button and subscribe and ring the bell. If you want to support the channel financially and you're able to do so, please check out my Patreon. If you just want to hang out with some other awesome folks, come and join my Discord server and sign up for my newsletter to catch my latest updates when I remember to, you know, send anything out. One of the challenges of running a horror game is making sure that you're respecting your player's boundaries. So for some help with that, uh, check out my video about running your own session zero. Until next time, play fair and have fun. You know what? This would have been a good outfit for a, a Midgard campaign setting review or a, or, or a Theros review. Oh well.